Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. My name is Pastor Josh. For those of you who do not know me, I'm the executive pastor here at the church. And most Sundays, I'm up with your teenagers. So I'm excited to be here and continue this series as we're talking about stories of Jesus in the Bible. And today we're going to be reading from Luke chapter 5. But I want to give you a little bit of context of what's going on in the story before I go ahead and um, go into that message. So Jesus is teaching from somebody's home. And it is crowded. It's not just like there's a few people in the kitchen, there's a few people in the living room. It says that there is a large crowd trying to hear what Jesus is speaking about. And in fact, this crowd is so large that there's pretty much no way to get to Jesus at this point. There's like this wall of people surrounding him. And this is where we pick up our story. In Luke chapter 5, verse 17, it says this. On one of those days, as he being Jesus was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. So we need to understand what's going on here. It seems like it's a small sentence that Pharisees were showing up and listening to Jesus, but when we understand who the Pharisees were, we understand that this is no small thing. These Pharisees were experts in the Old Testament. Believe it or not, these Pharisees would have the entire Old Testament memorized from beginning to end. I believe that's around 40 books of the Bible memorized. You throw a description in the Old Testament and they'll throw it right back at you. These guys were experts and doctors of the law. So imagine this now. Jesus is teaching and that there are teachers coming from the Yale Seminary. They're coming from Harvard School of Theology. And all these people are there looking for one thing. They would try to find Jesus to make a tiny mistake so they can start an argument. The whole reason these Pharisees were showing up was not to cheer for Jesus as he taught and preached. Their whole point was to start an argument, to start a debate with him. They'd won. They were like heresy hunters. They are looking for him to say heresy. And second, they wanted to sharpen their own skills against somebody else. So in verse 17b, the second half of that verse, we see this. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. The power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal. Who was the power with? So understand what's going on here in Scripture. Many times in the Bible we see this same formula. Where there's teaching and preaching of the word of God... And then there's signs, wonders, and miracles to confirm the word that was being spoken. So as we look into this story, we see that Jesus is teaching, but he's not just speaking words. He also has the power. If you've read 1 Corinthians chapter 4, it says that the kingdom of God is not only in talk, but is also in power. We see that Jesus has the power to back up the words that he's speaking. And believe it or not, many times in the scripture... The miracle signs and wonders aren't for the Christians. Many times we see that miracle signs and wonders are for the unbelievers. That the miracle that confirms the gospel being preached is kind of their milk faith, that beginner, like baby like faith, where they're able to put their faith in Jesus from that moment moving forward. So in this crowd, we've established that there are Pharisees, there are people trying to catch Jesus out. But as we're going to see in a little bit, there's also people that are seeking Jesus by faith. And I'm sure there's a whole lot of people somewhere in the middle on that spectrum. And in verse 18, it says this. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. Something miraculous happens when we take those issues that we have in our life and we place them before Jesus. Verse 19, but finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and they let him down with his bed through the tiles 
into the midst before Jesus. Now, this account in Luke is a little bit more friendly about what these guys did here. But in modern day, what these friends did is called first-degree criminal mischief. <laughs> the destruction of somebody else's property, I believe it's $1,500 or more. These four friends, I love their faith, but if I was cleaning all day because I knew people were going to be over my house to hear Jesus preach, and all of a sudden I hear a ding, 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 and I see a chainsaw <laughs> going through my roof, I'm going to have some problems. Who here, if someone's cutting a hole in your house, you'd be like, look at their faith. Yes. <laughs> Cut down that roof. I can get another roof. Most of us would be like, get off my roof. So we see here that these four friends, that they were blocked, that there was a crowd standing in front of them. So these four had to look for another way to get to Jesus. And I think what we can learn from these four friends today is this idea that where there's a will, there's a, there's a way. Where there is a will, there is a way. Now, in our culture, we use this sentence to pretty much say this. If I really want something, there's always a way that it's possible. That's not true at all. Not, I can go try to go for the NBA. It ain't happening. It's all right. I'm not quite tall enough. But in the kingdom of God... This statement where there's a will, there's a way, takes on a brand new meaning. What do I mean? Where something is God's will, God will always provide a way. In the kingdom of God, where there's a will, there is a way. I want you to understand something today. That the truths that are in scripture, that they're not something that we can maybe get to one day. But the promises of God and what God is speaking over us, that if it is God's will that we have something, there is a way for it to happen. For example, you're feeling down. You're feeling depressed. You feel like you have nothing to look forward to in your life. But then you look into the scriptures to see what is God's will in this situation. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So if it is God's will that I always rejoice, then God has made a way for me to always rejoice in his Son, Christ Jesus. If it's God's will that I would give thanks in every circumstance, if it's God's will, I always have a reason to give thanks in Christ Jesus. Let's make this personal. You've been dealing with a sickness or an infirmity in your body, and you know that God has spoken to you, saying that that sickness is not yours to hold because I've already taken it. If it is God's will that you be healthy and whole, God will make a way. 1 Peter chapter 2. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his stripes we are healed. If it's God's will, God always makes a way. Where there's his will, there is away. Maybe you're someone that feels like you keep getting stuck in the same mistakes. You keep making the same mistake over and over and over again. And you know that this is not where God wants you to be. If it's God's will that you wouldn't make those mistakes, then he's going to make a way, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 10. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you might be able to endure it. So if it's God's will that we would not fall into temptation, he always will provide a way of escape. And here's what I love about God. Thinking about my own life, 
Have I fallen to temptation before? Of course. Will I fall into temptation again? Most like, of course, not even most likely, of course. But even though God knows I'm going to fail and not take his help, he still provides a way for me. Even though I might be faithless, God is still faithful. I love to use this example upstairs. If I was going to pick up somebody from the bus stop and I knew they weren't going to show up, I would never show up. I'm not going to make a way. God is the friend that shows up for you even when you don't want to talk to him. What a friend we have in God. I love that God's faithfulness means that he provides for us even in the terms where we're not going to take it. I love that Jesus died for all the sins of humanity even though he knew that people would reject him. This is the God that we serve where it is his will he always makes a way. And I believe it's clear in this story. It was God's will that this man who was paralyzed would walk again. It was God's will that this man who was paralyzed would get up out of that situation carrying his bed. And where it was God's will, where we saw that the power was with Jesus to heal, there was a a way for them. So you might say to ourselves, so if God makes the way, then I can just fold my army, right? I don't need to go to work. Let's go to the beach. God's going to provide for my bills. Let's go. Not quite, right? That sounds crazy, right? It doesn't mean that we can do nothing. But what we can do is do what these four friends said. They said, if it's God's will that our friend is healed, this crowd standing in front of me is nothing. Because I need to get my friend to the feet of Jesus. And we see that they climbed up on that roof. They fired up their chainsaw. They committed that that felony to get their friend to Jesus. I believe that God will always provide an opportunity for us. And don't go cutting up people's roofs, please. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying even when it looks like there's something that's stopping us from what God has for us, there is a way. I believe that there's something so powerful that happens when we align our faith with God's will. We know that where it's God's will, there's always a way. But when we align our faith with what God has for us, the world better watch out. The world better watch out. Watch what happens in verse 20. It says, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees were like, ah, right, here we go. There's the heresy. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies they say who can forgive sins but god alone and they were right but they were wrong to assume that jesus wasn't god this statement that jesus is saying where he's saying his sins are forgiven jesus is making himself equal with god and the pharisees they jump to their feet they say this is blasphemy Who is this person saying this? Verse 22, when Jesus perceived their thoughts, imagine arguing with somebody in your head and they read your mind. That would be annoying. He perceives their thoughts and he answers them. Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk? But that you might know That the Son of Man, that Jesus has authority on earth to forgive sins, Jesus says to the man who is paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately, say immediately. Immediately. Immediately he rose up before them, he picked up what he had been lying on, and he went home glorifying God. So here in this story, we see that there's one crowd gathered around the same Jesus who's preaching the same sermon to everybody. Everybody sees the same miracles. Everybody is gathered in the same place. But while one person is getting healed from being paralyzed, the other people have hardened hearts. They see the same exact situation, yet we see the lens of faith. 
which reaches out to Jesus, and we see the lens of the Pharisee that rejects Jesus. Same exact Jesus, but two completely different hearts. And today, I want to talk about both sides of this coin, starting with the lens of the Pharisee. And before I start talking about the lens of the Pharisee, and you say, well, this isn't for me. Let me check out for about five minutes so we get to faith, because that's me. I want you to know, it is very easy to become the things that we swear we're incapable of becoming. I have a group chat with my four siblings. And you know what we do is? We send messages of how we're turning into our parents. (laughs) We can say to ourselves, I will never be like my dad. And then someone points out something to me, I'm like, oh, it's happening. (laughs) Oh, the transformation is occurring. And we send each other messages all the time of, uh, what did my sister do? She was uh, talking to the dog like a human. She's like, I'm turning into mom, no. (laughs) All these stories we have. But in this story, we see the Pharisees. They witness the wonder-working power of Jesus that everybody else did. These Pharisees heard the same sermon that everybody else did. What separated the Pharisees from the rest of the crowd was the Pharisees knew the word of God better than anybody else on the planet. They could quote the Bible beginning to end. They had knowledge of God and God's word that nobody else had on the planet. From the age of two, their eyes were fixated on God's word, yet when God's word became flesh and dwelt among them, they crucified him. How is it possible that those who know the word of God better than anybody else on the planet would crucify Jesus as he's standing right there in front of them? How could somebody so well trained in the scripture that dedicates their entire life to the word completely miss what God is doing? They were so committed to their understanding of God that they rejected him. Let that sink in. They were so committed to their version of here's who God is that when God showed up on the scene, he didn't fit their picture, so they crucified him. This is the lens of the Pharisee. They saw the miracles, they saw the wonders, but because they knew it all already, because they didn't need anyone to teach them, they were the teachers, they missed out what God was doing in the moment. They were so committed to their definition of God that they missed God right in front of them. And I wish I could look back on my life and say, oh, I've never done that. I've just just squeaky clean perfection. I've gotten it right every single time. But there are times when I've been in debates, in arguments about the word of God, and I was 100% sure in my mind that I was right, and guess what I wasn't? I was not right. I was completely wrong. And guess what? That's okay. We're all on a journey together. None of us are going to get things perfect. But my point today is that in order to grow in our relationship with God, we cannot approach God with the mentality of, I know it all. We can't approach God with the mentality of, I got this one, God. Something that I've heard many times before in mainstream media and even in the church as well was this idea that if I was God, I would have done things differently. And that's why you're not God. (laughs) That is exactly why you are not God. The reality is, on this journey, every single year, sometimes every day, we're going to grow in our understanding of God is. We're going to see God differently as we go deeper in our relationship with him. Not because he changes, because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, but it's because Me changes. It's because we're changing on this journey. And in the story, we see that the Pharisees were not open to being changed, that they had hardened hearts towards Jesus. 
They operated in this mindset of confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is seeing information and seeing it in a way that agrees with what you already believe. You're saying, this is my lens of who God is. Jesus doesn't fit it, so Jesus is preaching heresy. I remember one time when I was little, my sister was on a stealing streak. Like, everybody's stuff was missing. She had no problem going and taking what she wanted. And one day, I was missing my favorite pen. And I'm like, I know she stole it. Where's my pen? I didn't steal it. And I kept pressing her. I'm like, you thief, I know that you stole it. My lenses were so fixated on the idea that my sister was a thief that I didn't see my pen right in front of me on my desk. That is the same exact thing that the Pharisees were doing. They had a lens that said, this is who God is, even though God was standing right in front of them. In our lives, it's very easy to hold on to our definitions instead of God's definitions. It is very easy to hold on to our definitions instead of God's definitions. But here's what God says about you. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. In all of our minds, we probably had a moment where like the old us pops up and we say, the new hasn't come. I've made that mistake so many times and I feel like I'm right there in the same place that I was 10 years ago. You know what that is? That's us holding on to our definition of ourselves instead of God's definition. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his, meaning God's, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You are God's workmanship. But if I'm being honest, it doesn't always feel that way. Sometimes it's easy to feel like, you know, God made a mistake with me. I wish God would have created me different or given me a different set of gifts and talents. It's easy to hold on to our definitions of ourselves instead of God's definition. Genesis 127. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Can I let you in on a little secret? You can't be created in the image of God and have no purpose for your life. You cannot be created in the image of God and not be loved by God. You cannot be created in the image of God and have a purpose in God's own creation. You cannot be created in the image of God and not have dominion. What's my point today? Sometimes what we feel about ourselves does not agree with what God says about us. And I want you to know, go with what God says. Take God's word for it. He knows a little bit better than us. When I say a little bit, I mean he knows way better than we ever can. So as I thought about this, I'm like, all right. The reality is we're all on a journey. We're all going to be learning. Is there a question that I can ask myself to make sure that my mind is in alignment with God's word? And here's a question I want us to ask ourselves, not just today, but as we're going through this week. Am I more committed to my identity and my former self? than God's definition of who I truly am? Am I more committed to the old self rather than who God says that I am? There's going to be these moments where we might have those thoughts creep in, those thoughts of you're not good enough. You are a mistake. Oh, come on. You know that if you weren't a mistake, things would look different, right? And those thoughts begin to creep up. You know what you do when those thoughts creep up? You say, um, according to my Bible, um, I'm created in the image of God. So being created in God's image means that those thoughts are lies. Because any word that disagrees with the word of God is not the truth. Because God's word is the absolute truth. 
Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8 says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. What does that mean for us? It means that if I, if I am God's workmanship, prepared for good works, that word stands forever. It's no take backs. If I'm a new creation in Christ and the old has passed away and the new has come according to his word, that word stands forever. If I'm created in the image of God, that word stands forever. It cannot be taken back. And you might think to yourself, well, I don't always think properly. I make mistakes all the time. Well, I want to encourage you to see yourself as these, the men in the story did through the lens of faith. And that's the second half of what we're going to be speaking about today, the lens of faith. And as we look through this story, I want us to apply some of these truths in our own lives. In verse 18, it says this. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. They were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. If you're taking point, notes today, the first point is faith seeks. Faith seeks. They were seeking Jesus by faith. Imagine I said, all right, we're going to play hide and seek for the rest of service. I'm going to count to 20. Everybody run out of the family room and go hide. And I count up 18, 19, 20. Ready or not, here I come. And I just stand here. After 10 minutes, you're going to be like, my hiding spot is so good. He can't find me. Woo, I'm killing it. After an hour, you're going to say something's wrong. There's no way this is an hour-long hiding spot. Was I seeking in that moment? No. Because many times, faith is accompanied with an action. They were seeking Jesus in their hearts, of course. But seeking Jesus in their hearts by faith led to an action. It led to them seeing a crowd. The crowd says to the normal eye, I can't get to Jesus. Sorry, buddy. We'll try another time. Faith says, I see a wall, but I can see Jesus on the other side of that wall. And if Jesus is what God has in store for me, then this wall might as well not even be here because I'm getting to him by faith. Faith always seeks. The Greek word for seeking here is zeteo. And it means to seek with your eyes, but it also means to get to the bottom of a matter. When there's like a murder TV show and somebody gets killed, the detective walks in, we're going to get to the bottom of this. Why? The detective assumes that there's a murderer. I want you to know in our faith, we assume that we have a solution to our problems in Jesus Christ. We assume that God is working on our behalf. Whatever matter you might have in your life, I want you to know when you get to the bottom of that problem, that we have a firm foundation found in Jesus Christ. This is our reality as New Testament saints. I want you to know today that our faith is rooted in Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14 says this, And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. Newsflash, Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and he lives forevermore. Amen. And if that is true, that means that our faith is not in vain. We do not place our faith in the dead God. We faith, place our faith in the God who is living. Amen. The God that was risen from the grave. Amen. I love that we serve a God that isn't distant from us, but is right here. I love that we serve a God that didn't stay in heaven and extend an arm, but would send himself into his creation to die for our sins. As you look into verse 24, Jesus says to the man, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them, 
and he picked up what he had been laying on, and he went home. Number two, faith obeys. Faith obeys. Now we need to understand here, for Jesus to say to a man who cannot walk, to get up and to pick up your bed, is like for Jesus to say to us who are walking, flap your wings and fly home, and we just start flapping away like, we think, you're crazy, right? Sometimes faith sounds crazy. Sometimes what God's saying isn't going to make sense to us, but faith will obey God even in those moments when our eyes aren't seeing what we want to see. Earlier in Luke chapter 5, Simon Peter, he was fishing all night long. He was fishing, and they caught no fish. And then Jesus says, hey, cast your net on the other side of the boat. And watch what Simon Peter says. He says, Master, we toiled all night, or we worked all night, and we caught nothing. But at your word, he says, but at your word, I will let down the nets. He's tried everything to catch a fish in his own strength, and he couldn't catch a fish. But you know what happened when he dropped his net at the word of Jesus? He caught more fish than he could even handle. And I believe that somebody here needs to have an at your word type of moment. Where you've tried every medication, you've tried every doctor, and you're saying, God, this is not working out. But at your word, I'm going to take a hold of what you have in store for me. Some of you here have teens that don't want to listen to you. And they think they're sick upstairs, acting all nice and behaved. Like, I know. I was there once. And you're saying, God, I'm trying to train up this child in the way they should go, but they just won't listen. I want you to have a but at your word type of moment. If God's word says when they grow old, they shall not depart, I want you to stand on that word. Amen. Whatever thing you're dealing with today, I want to encourage you that the word of God has the power to change situations. Yeah, yeah. The word of God is what has changed our hearts to follow Jesus. The word of God has the power to transform. Verse 26, an amazement seized them all, and they glorified. They glorified God, and they were filled with awe, saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. I want you to know today that faith glorifies God. When you look up the word glorify, it simply means to worship. And I want you to know that whatever stage of your life you are in, that Jesus is always worthy of worship. Wherever you might find yourself, even in this story, Jesus is always worthy of of worship. Maybe in this story you're the paralyzed man. You feel like you're stuck, like you can't move, like you need help. I want you to know in those times that Jesus is worthy of worship. Maybe you're the person that's carrying others, but you feel like nobody is carrying you. I want you to know that Jesus is worthy of worship. Maybe you're the person that just saw a crowd like, I'll check this out. What's going on? Who's this Jesus guy? I want you to know for the crowd member that Jesus is worthy of worship. In this story, we see that there's a paralyzed man that Jesus is preaching. That after he preaches, he speaks to the Pharisees. After he speaks to the Pharisees, the man was healed. And then they glorified God. It's this journey where Jesus does something, and then they glorify God. But believe it, believe it or not, for us, we get to do that backwards. Because we have what they didn't have. We have the finished work of Jesus Christ at work in our lives today. So when we're looking for a reason to glorify God, we don't have to say, I have to wait till something gets done. We say, oh, wait a second, 2,000 years ago, the Father sent His Son to the earth, and He was crucified for my sins. 
And when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he didn't say it is started. He said it is finished. So because the work has already been finished, I'm going to praise God right now, even if things aren't looking how I think they should look. This is the privilege that we have as New Testament saints. We have a firm foundation in Jesus Christ. So if you're here today and you're waiting for Jesus to do more, I want to encourage you. He's already done it. He has already done it. If you're believing God for something, don't quit now. If you have a problem and you feel like there's no solution, do not quit now. Just think about in the last five years, a time when you were super stressed and you said, there is no way this is going to end right. I'm done for. And you look back at it now, you're like, wow, God came through for me. And I want you to know that God is faithful and he'll do it again and again and again. And if you're here and you've never accepted this Jesus, you've never accepted Jesus into your heart, I want to encourage you that one of the greatest miracles we can see is this thing known as salvation or accepting God as our personal Lord and Savior. There's this story in the Bible where Jesus sends out 70 disciples and he gives them the authority to heal people in his name and the authority to cast out demons in his name. And the 70 come back and they say, Lord, the demons, they have to obey us at your name. Do you know what Jesus says to them? He says, don't celebrate that demons follow your command at my name. He says, celebrate that your name is written in the book of life. He's saying it's cool that all that's happening. Do you not realize that you are eternally secured? What a miracle. The earth is a massive place. The universe is so massive, it is unfathomable. There are so many stars and galaxies, so many planets that are in our universe, and God would look at us, each individual on the earth, and say, in the midst of everything, I'm going to send my son to die for you, and you, and you, and you, and you. What a miracle we have in Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says that if we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. So if you want to take that opportunity today to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, we all pray a prayer together, and it goes like this. Repeat after me. Say, Dear God, I come to you today just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I believe that you died and rose for me. Come into my heart, come into my life to change me and make me new. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel, and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.